Absolutely. Uh, Professor Chauncey, uh, yes, let sir. us skip to uh, tab 23. Uh, and um, this is a Los Angeles Times story dated July 10th, 1996. It's entitled, Area Lawmaker Rejects Same-Sex Marriages But Backs Partnership Role. And then at the bottom of uh, this first page, and uh, this is DIX 1482, uh, it, it states, uh, O'Connell, a Democrat who represents Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties, as well as parts of western Ventura County, said he supported granting same-sex couples certain legal rights that heterosexual couples enjoys, such as hospital visitation rights and shared health care benefits, but that he had difficulty supporting gay and lesbian marriages. Quote, my impression is that the term marriage is too steeped in socio-religious traditions and mores for people to feel comfortable with its applications to gays and lesbians, O'Connell said in a prepared statement. Neil Demers Gray, director of Unity Pride Coalition of Ventura County, applauded O'Connell's vote. I think it's a very equitable position for him to take, she said. Um, Professor, isn't it true that during the mid-1990s, uh, gay rights activists thought it was an equitable position for people to take to support domestic partnerships, even while preserving the traditional definition of marriage? Uh, well, I don't want to generalize about all gay activists on the basis of a single quote. Um, but many took that view, isn't that right? Well, this is at a time when marriage was beginning to really um, explode on the national scene with the Hawaii decision in 1993, uh, but still seemed a far distant prospect to many gay activists, given the strength of um, the opposition to it. Uh, this, I'm not quite sure of the date, but this would have been issued at about the time that uh, DOMA, uh, the, the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, had been passed. And so I don't know the particulars here, but I could imagine that in this context, someone would be happy to get at least this part of what people were looking for, um, given the scope of opposition to marriage. Um, Your Honor, we'd ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 1482. Thank you very well, 1482. Okay, and Your Honor, at this point, we'd like to uh, to uh, put the binder aside and skip the rest of the tabs. So it was uh, time well spent during the break and move to some videos. And if we may, we'd like to play uh, DIX 2616. Well, it, it's a video of an elderly couple who've been beaten up by opponents of Prop 8. Your Honor, I, I think I know this video from a deposition, and I do, we do object to it. Um, we think that it lacks foundation, and it also um, is um, not relevant to the issues that this witness testified to. And your no bearing on his testimony, quite frankly. And, Your Honor, the reason it's highly relevant is because we intend to show some videos now in which supporters of Proposition 8 were harassed, subject to violence. And I want to ask the witness whether one of the reasons that the – he's testified that there's still discrimination against gays and lesbians today. And I want to ask him if one of the reasons why there is still that discrimination is because of the types of tactics we saw employed against supporters of Prop 8. Your Honor, if I might, number one, the, the, this is um, hearsay evidence of um, people who, um, the, the, the video, basically, if it's the one I, I'm aware of, and I, I think it was introduced in the Sanders deposition, it, it completely lacks foundation. It also has zero to do with what this um, witness has testified about. And they're going to put up claim things where people claimed that they were harassed. There's no foundation to even prove that they were harassed. And then he's going to ask this witness to speculate about whether uh, some people may have voted for Proposition 8 because somebody was harassed and they put out news reports claiming that. I think we're far afield. I think chaff doesn't even begin to state where we are at this point. It, it does seem to me, Mr. Thompson, you can explore this topic without showing the video. I, I could. I just thought that it might uh, make it more concrete, but I, I'm happy to do it either way, Your Honor. Well, if you can explore it without the video, since there isn't a 
foundation for the video. That's fine, but uh, I think it's a it's a fair enough uh, line of inquiry. Okay. So you may proceed. Uh, Professor Chauncey, are you aware of the fact that there were some churches that were defaced uh, and vandalized during the Proposition 8 campaign? Um, I have no detailed knowledge of uh, these things. I've, I've heard that there were various incidents. And, and have you heard that there were incidents in which people had their businesses boycotted? as a result of donating as little as $100 to Proposition 8? Um, I've heard things that sex said. And, and have you heard that some people were subjected to uh, physical violence uh, as a result of their support for Proposition 8? Um, I had not heard that. Were you aware that the mayor of Fresno was subject to a death threat that was so severe that the police uh, went out and tried to arrest the person who sent the email. Um, isn't it true that these types of tactics by supporters of the LGBT community have the potential to backfire and create resentment uh, against the LGBT community? Well, honestly, I don't know the details here. I'm not, I don't know what the basis is for claiming that these were um, perpetrated by uh, members of the LGBT community. And I, I'm really not in a position to assess um, what effect they may or may not have had here. I'm really so, so just so the record's clear, in terms of uh, the level of discrimination against gays and lesbians in the United States today, you don't know the extent to which it's attributable to aggressive, violent acts that supporters of the LGBT community have taken? Um, I think that you would have to make a very elaborate case for me to believe that that is the case. But you haven't studied it. Um, I have not studied that, but it seems um, unlikely to me on the face of it. But again, that's not something I've studied. Um, Your Honor, at this point, we'd like to play uh, PX116, which has been admitted. Uh, well, actually, before we play that, uh, PX116, which has been admitted into evidence. But before we get to that, let me ask you, Professor, it's true that the voters of California received information about Prop 8 from a myriad of sources, correct? Yes. From friends, correct? I assume that was the case. From radio, correct? Them so? From uh, the internet? I assume that was the case. From the newspapers? I assume that was the case. From their places of worship? I assume that was the case. From TV? Yes. A a and many people don't form their opinions on important political topics based on TV ads, correct? Uh, you know, I'm really... Um, best at just describing what I see as the messaging being developed. Um, and and, and uh, I don't consider myself to be an expert on you know, election analysis. OK, well, uh, I, I'm asking these questions as uh, a run up since he had opined on the TV ads that were run on it. Let me ask you, Professor, uh, isn't it true that you, you, you testified, you were asked about the purposes and effects of Proposition 8. Isn't it true that some people voted on Prop 8 based on their sincerely held uh, moral values without regard to what was on TV? Um. Uh, you know, I I'm, I'm imagine that that is the case, and again, one has to understand the history shaping those moral values and the meaning of those moral values. Um, many people have, as I said yesterday, have opposed desegregation and interracial marriage on the basis of deeply held moral values. Um, and the con because of the context of hostility and prejudice towards the groups would have um, his lives would have been changed by desegregation and interracial marriage. Um, I think that's probably the case today. It's true that most people, when they vote, try to reflect their moral values, correct? Uh, I'm not 
really in a position to answer that question. Well, you're, uh, you've taught survey classes on 20th century uh, U.S. history, correct? Uh, yes, and I think we can say that a wide range of factors affect people's vote. But, but it's part it, it, wide range of factors affect people's vote behavior. But it's part of the American political tradition for people to vote on important issues consistent with their religious uh, views. Isn't that right? Um, we see that on some issues um, more than on others. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, is there? Uh, they have the right to do what they wish, but we, as historians, would, under, would, want, would want to understand what shaped those values and those attitudes. Um, now I'd like to play uh, PX116. Well, it's, it's been admitted into evidence, and what it is, it's the four-and-a-half-minute version of the 30-second ad that he was shown yesterday. So it's directly relevant, Your Honor, to his direct testimony. This is the Worthlands. Uh, th th this is the Worthlands, the couple from uh, Massachusetts uh, who uh, describe the reason what happened in Massachusetts. Then that was created and turned into a 30-second ad, which Professor Chauncey testified to yesterday. Has the witness seen this uh, four-minute version? I'd like to ask him if he did. Uh, did uh, no, I don't believe I have. All right. All right. You may play 116. Californians have a lot to consider when they go to the polls on Proposition 8. There are many consequences for Californians should Proposition 8 fail to be enacted. Some of the most profound consequences are for children. In 2003, the Massachusetts Supreme Court legalized gay marriage, and it wasn't long afterwards that Rob and Robin Worthland experienced those consequences firsthand. Well, in 2003, the Massachusetts Supreme Court uh, legalized marriage between homosexuals. And uh, it was to the acclaim of many, many people, but it caused a lot of concern for others. Concern that rights would be infringed, particularly if you disagreed with gay marriage. In March of 2006, our son came home from school, and he said, our teacher read us the silliest book today. It was so funny. It was about a prince who married another prince, not a princess. And then they became the king and the king. And we were surprised. We thought maybe my, our son had gotten the details wrong. So we emailed the teacher, and she called us back and told us, yes. This was actually being read aloud by the teacher in class. Well, we were surprised and really astonished because we felt like second grade is very young to be introducing the concept of homosexuality and gay marriage. We thought they would at least wait until they had sex ed in fifth or sixth grade. And it was just shocking that, you know, our son started talking about men marrying other men. What happened when you expressed your concerns to the school? Even though this book was not a part of the curriculum, it was something that they had to do. And we thought that we would be informed before they talked about merit matters involving human sexuality. When we asked them if they could let us know before they read books like this or talked about the subject, they said no. We decided that our only recourse was to turn to the courts. And so we, we went to the uh, first district court here in, in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and uh, the judge ruled against us. And some of the ruling I thought was very troubling. Um, to, to paraphrase, he suggested that the state must teach these things to children before they've had a chance to make up their own minds. What do California voters need to know about what happened in Massachusetts? Voters in California need to understand that while the love between two people may be real and genuine. To redefine marriage has an impact at every level of society, especially at the youngest levels of society, our children. And, and no longer is it okay to disagree that if you disagree with a particular lifestyle or behavior, you are now wrong, you are now bigoted. It's no longer a dis difference of opinion. You are wrong. 
Lexington Public Schools has come out with a new curriculum where they will teach about homosexuality and gay marriage in every topic. In math, in reading, in social studies, in spelling, there will be terms and concepts of homosexuality promoted at, in every subject, at every level, from kindergarten on up. Um, parents will have no right to object, and schools will roll this forth whether they like it or not. And the tolerance that the gay community cries out for is not demonstrated to people who have differing points of view. There is no tolerance. The hate, the, the disparaging remarks, the hostility that we face were so astonishing. When we sincerely wanted to um, just protect our children while they're children, not have them face adult issues while they're children. There's long enough time in their life that they can work through adult issues. But we just wanted them to have a, a carefree and protected childhood. Now, uh, Professor, did you review that as one of the materials you considered in this case? Um, uh, no, though, actually, I, now that I've seen it, I realize I hadn't seen it before. Okay. Is it reasonable for parents who morally disapprove of homosexuality to want to wait until the fifth or sixth grade for those sorts of issues to be taught in public school? Well, would you say that people who morally disapprove of racial equality or interracial marriage should be able to um, insist that no books showing black and white people as equal or black and white people in relationships should be uh, kept out of the schools? And I, I think there's a general sense uh, in the schools that if you wish, you can send your child to a private school, but there are um, things that will be discussed in a public school. Um, and that this is a, a part of the reality of, of life in Massachusetts now in, in the country. And would you agree, though, at least that parents have the primary responsibility for raising their own children? Um, uh, parents certainly have a primary responsibility in raising their children, but they also raise them in a society which provides many other um, mechanisms to um, teach them uh, and um, educate them. And uh, Do you agree that the parent's responsibility for raising their child includes development of the child's moral character? Your Honor, he, he testified about what these ads were intended, what subliminal messages about stereotypes they were played on, and so I want to probe whether that's really true or whether it was going to a different issue, which was parents wanting to inculcate their children on their moral values. How much longer do you have on this? Three more questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, and uh, you would agree that uh, parents have responsibility for developing their child's moral character, including on issues relating to sexual morality? Uh, there have been debates for a very long time about um, what exactly um, can happen in schools and where parents can withdraw their children. Um, from what, uh, and in general, I think the understanding is that um, uh, Schools are free to uh, and encouraged to teach um, broader social values. And in this case, the child is simply being um, exposed to the existence of gay people. Um, and I take note that the parents don't express concern just about marriage, but about homosexuality at all. Do you agree that uh, issues relating to homosexuality and same-sex marriage are issues for parents to discuss with their children according to their own values and beliefs? Um, I, I s agree that parents can do that, yes. And, and then you would agree with the proponents of Proposition 8 that parents would have a right to object if their young children were being taught in public school that there's no difference between same-sex marriage and traditional marriage if that teaching contradicted the parents' own moral values and beliefs, correct? Um, well, I don't think that they would be able to object to schools teaching about interracial marriage if that conflicted with their moral beliefs.
And so they shouldn't be able, in your opinion, to object if uh, the children are being taught about same-sex marriage, even if it conflicts with their moral beliefs. That's your view? I, I think they're welcome to object, but I don't think that, that objection would be winning in this case, no. Uh, no further questions, Your Honor. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Redirect, Ms. Stewart. Good afternoon, Professor Chauncey. Not yet. Oh. <laughs> it just feels like that long a day. It feels like <laughs> afternoon. It, it just seems like afternoon. Good morning, Ms. Professor Chauncey. Good morning. Does uh, Proposition 8 say anything about when sex education takes place? Uh, no, it does not. Does it say anything about what parents can teach their children? No, it does not. Does it say anything about what schools or parents discuss with children and when? Does it say anything about what parents can object to in terms of the schools? No. We were just looking at the, the long ad with the, the Worthlands, and I'm wondering um, if you have any thoughts about the reference to uh, gay marriage or homosexuality as a, quote, homosexual relationships, an adult issue? Well, again, I think it, it implies that um, there's something wrong with homosexuality. Uh, it, it, uh, it focuses entirely, uh, it suggests a focus on homosexuality entirely as a matter of sexuality, not love, not relationships. This is actually a book about to princes falling in love, um, and it's a fairy tale. It doesn't talk about sex. It's um, it's a, another fairy tale that seems appropriate to that that age. Are there fairy tales about men and women falling in love? I believe there are. Yes. Um, is is heterosexual marriage viewed as an adult issue in our culture? Uh, I don't believe that it's something that we keep our children from. No. Do children sometimes even play a role in heterosexual weddings? Uh, I believe they have been exposed to heterosexual weddings, yes. Well, have you ever heard of a flower child or a flower girl? Uh, ring bearer? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I have heard that children have been allowed to be present in and even play a role in heterosexual marriages. Um, are there any other themes in the Worthlands ad that you uh, care to comment on, the, the one that we just saw? Well, again, I think there is the implication here that the very exposure to the idea of homosexuality and gay people somehow threatens the children, um, threatens their sexual identity, as if that's a choice, uh, that this is something again, that's being imposed on them. Um, uh, historically, gay rights have often been depicted in that way as something, I mean, the very fact that gay people are asking to be recognized and to have their relationships recognized even by marriage is seen as an imposition on other people rather than simply uh, um, the extension of fundamental civil rights to those people. I want to um, move on to a subject that you testified about a little bit um, on cross that uh, Mr. Thompson asked you about and he asked you a number of questions about um, your um, uh, book and, and uh, I think your uh, report in this case regarding when uh, uh, Americans and, and, and sort of Western society began to understand that homosexual people were um, a class of people, people with a primary um, uh, attraction or, or relationship um, with someone of the same sex. But I want to ask you to put aside the issue of when people began to understand that concept and ask you whether there's evidence in the historical record even before those categories were understood um, that there were people whose primary erotic and emotional attraction was to people of the same sex. Okay. Um, uh, this is certainly something that historians are studying today. Um, there's a, a broad sense, it's, it's contested as most issues in history are, but a broad sense that um, the categories of hetero and homosexual emerged and became primary organizing categories of state regulation and personal identity uh, beginning in the late 19th century. Um, but 
A number of studies have been published, and, and I actually use some of these in my teaching um, studies and primary sources and so forth, that do suggest that they were people who had a, <coughs> excuse me, a primary um, erotic and affectional interest in people of the same sex uh, before then. So I'll, I'll give you just a couple of examples. Um, one is um, in Puritan New, New England, um, in Connecticut, uh, in the uh, uh, 17th century, a uh, case of Nicholas Sension, who's one of the most extensive court records we have um, access to. Uh, and what's clear there is that although people did not first call him a homosexual, this was not a term available to him, and that wouldn't fully explain his, his uh, mode of life, uh, that he had developed a reputation over the course of almost 30 years in his small town in Connecticut as someone who um, persistently indicated um, sexual interest in um, other males um, and approached them. He actually developed a reputation for this. Now, in this period, people didn't use a term like identity. They talked about character. They had a variety of ways of, of other frameworks through which to understand um, someone like Sension. So we wouldn't call him a, a homosexual in the sense of having a homosexual identity at that period. And yet um, there's strong evidence that, in fact, he had a consistent um, uh, erotic interest in people of the uh, same sex. Um, likewise, uh, a lot of attention has been paid to um, the, um, and, and I've written about the as well, the um, culture of romantic friendship in the 19th century. Um, there were a wider range of boundary, bounds of the kinds of relationships that people of the same sex could have, the degree of affection that they could express for one another. Um, what's striking when you get into some of the diaries and correspondence that we depend on to reconstruct those relationships um, are the moments when, um, uh, so I'll just give you an example. I, it's uh, a diary that I assign in my um, lecture course on lesbian and gay history written by Frances Willard, who later went on to found the Women's Christian Temperance Union. When she's young in the 1860s, she falls in love with a woman. The other woman falls in love with her. Everyone thinks it's great. It's very conventional. And yet a moment comes when Frances realizes that her attraction is much more powerful and sustaining than her friend Mary's. And there's a, a sort of crisis for her. So the, the, the boundaries of what's acceptable and the conventions allow them to take the relationship so far. And then Frances Willard realizes that this is something different for her. And she doesn't have a ready language for it, certainly not the language of homosexuality and heterosexuality, but she draws on all sorts of frameworks to try to understand how she's different from other women because of this passion that she feels for her friend Mary and would go on to feel for others. Likewise, in the early 20th century, in some, a period that we discussed at the very end of the day yesterday in, in direct, um, or uh, cross examination rather, um, talking about my book um, on the social organization of sexuality and uh, male sexuality in early 20th century New York. Yes, there was a wider range of um, uh, sexual possibilities for conventional sexual patterns in the part of some immigrant uh, working class communities in the early 20th century. Um, it was easier in that context for some men to shift back and forth between male and female partners. But their male partners were conventionally, typically, men who did define themselves on the basis of their difference from other males on the basis of their um, consistent desire for sex with those uh, with other men and relationships with other men. So again, understood somewhat differently than we would understand it today um, through a lens of gender inversion and so forth. But there were people at that time who were identified themselves and were identified by others on that basis. Perhaps you could throw a question in there somewhere. I was about to do that, Your Honor. Um, shifting to another topic. Uh, Dr. Chauncey, Mr. Um, Thompson asked you a number of questions about um, various lesbian and gay people who um, at some points weren't supportive of pursuing the right to marry. And he a lot of those questions focused on the period of uh, 60s and 70s. And I want to ask you, during the 60s and 70s, um, what were some of the priorities of the lesbian and gay uh, civil rights movement? 
Well, in the 60s and 70s, the fundamental um, priorities of most gay activists were to simply try to stop the policing of everyday life, um, the widespread arrest, the raids on bars and restaurants, um, and uh, then to achieve um, fundamental protections against discrimination uh, at the workplace uh, and in housing and so forth, and simply to um, be able to uh, come out uh, and to be openly known as gay without facing a whole range of forms of harassment and discrimination because of that. And before the mid-70s, um, were they also working on trying to get the medical establishment to change its view? Uh, yes, that certainly was a priority of some activists given the long. Let's let the witness testify, Ms. Stewart. Um, Dr. Chauncey, during the period um, when African-American civil rights were being um, uh, sought um, in, in this country, um, were there black people who sometimes uh, were not in favor of segregation? There were black people who were not in favor of segregation? Yes, uh, pushing for segregation. At or desegregation, do you mean? I'm sorry, desegregation. Yeah, yes. Yes. Um, uh, yes, there were debates amongst African-American activists about the best um, way to go, the priorities that the movement should have, um, fears about pushing the white uh, power structure too far. Um, Mr. Thompson asked you this morning about uh, a statement in your book, Why Marriage, about 92 percent of companies uh, providing uh, benefits to um, – uh, well, actually, let me just have you turn in your book to page 52. Uh, sorry, and which exhibit is my book? It's uh, six, I think, yeah. I think it's six. Yes. Right, so there's a reference to a survey in 2002 um, a survey of 319 of America's largest companies, and that survey of those 319 companies found that 92 percent of them prohibited workplace discrimination against gays and lesbians. And so your reference earlier to 92 percent was to that subset of companies, 319 large yes. companies. Yes. Is there still um, employment discrimination in this country today? Uh, yes, there is, on the basis of sexual orientation, yes. Mr. Thompson asked you the question, uh, and, and I think you responded, whether it's true that the federal government no longer prohibits people from entering the United States. Do you remember that? Yes. Can a heterosexual person marry a non-U.S. citizen and bring their spouse into this country under current law? Uh, no, in fact. A heterosexual person. Excuse me. No, a heterosexual person can um, bring their married partner from abroad into the country. And is the same thing true for gay people? No, it is not. You mentioned in your testimony in response to a question of Mr. Thompson that um, some people uh, need to move to California or do move to California to find a more open society. Do you remember that statement? Yes. Um, why do people need to move to California to find a more open society? Um. Uh, they do so because they um, continue to face hostility and discrimination in the places they live. And like um, other groups which have faced marginalization in the past, um, people have um, often moved. There were enormous migrations of African Americans from the Deep South to the relative freedom of northern cities and western cities over the course of the 20th century. Um, and there they found more freedom uh, than they would have found at home, um, but still certainly not um, complete freedom and rights. And uh, uh, drawing a sharp analogy between the two groups, I think that's a pattern that we've seen on the part of gay men and lesbians who uh, we have records since the late 19th century moving away from small towns to larger cities where they would be more likely to find people like themselves, relative freedom, but still, of course, encountered um, enormous hostility and discrimination. Thank you. Um, 
Mr. Thompson also asked you about a reference in that same exhibit, your book, Why Marriage, to, um, and it's on page 51, uh, to a statement that the 1990s m marked a major turning point um, of lesbians and gay men in American society. Do you remember that um, testimony? Uh, yes. Um, uh, I, th I believe you said that, w well, tell me again when the book was written. Uh, it was written in 2004. Since it was written, have there been some further laws enacted that reflect discrimination against gay people? Uh, well, the majority of states have enacted uh, legislation or constitutional amendments um, that would um, prohibit uh, same-sex couples from marrying. Have there been, uh, how have those measures been enacted? Are, are uh, 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 over, well, there have been uh, both by legislative vote, but there have also been a tremendous number of popular referenda which have um, enacted uh, that sort of discrimination. Do you believe that those measures have an impact on the ability of lesbian and gay people to seek equality through the political process? Uh, yes, I do. And I, maybe this is a moment to say that, um, since I wasn't able to in uh, cross-examination, that um, I was actually, um, I, I thought at the time that I published this book in 2004 that uh, there was um, a greater chance of marriage equality moving forward. Um, and that's the way I ended the book. Um, since then, uh, so many states have um, enacted these constitutional amendments and statutes uh, and have put such enormous roadblock in the way of movement on that issue that I'm um, uh, much less likely, uh, much less inclined to believe that that's the case. Um, I want to now turn to an area where uh, Mr. Thompson uh, focused a little bit um, on religion and religious beliefs. Um, and I think he asked you some questions about uh, religious organizations or churches that uh, support, supported um, uh, marriage equality. Do you remember that? Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us what some of the major faith groups were, some of the churches that were uh, strongly in support of Proposition 8 against marriage equality. The Baptists, the Catholic Church, um, a range of groups that would um, constitute a much larger percentage of the population, a much larger percentage of the population than the um, uh, small, old, mainline, as they call them, Protestant churches. And um, I believe that uh, when he showed you a video of uh, Pastor Warren, um, he asked you a question along the lines of, you know, has the... Um, religious rhetoric or, or language being used about homosexuals by religious people of faith uh, become more polite or, or nicer or something along those lines. Do you remember that? Yes. I'd like to ask you to look at uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 301, which may I approach, Your Honor? Oh. <clears throat> Now, this is um, a document from the website uh, of the Vatican um, um, or a, the Catholics for the Common Good, I should say. It's, it's, it's a, from uh, a Catholic organization. And um, it's excerpts from a Vatican document on legal recognition of, of same-sex unions. Um, and I, I would ask you to read um, the third paragraph and third paragraph on this page, on, on the first page. Uh, there are absolutely no grounds. Yes. There, there are absolutely no grounds for considering homosexual unions to be in any way similar or even remotely analogous to God's plan for marriage and the family. Marriage is holy, while homosexual acts go against the natural moral law. Homosexual acts close the sexual acts to the gift of life. They do not proceed from a genuine, effective, and sexual complementarity. Under no circumstances can they be approved. Would you also read the last sentence of the next paragraph? Evidence? Um, oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I'd like to move this document into evidence. Uh, 
Your Honor, no objection. 12301 is admitted. The homosexual inclination is, however, objectively disordered, and homosexual practices are sins gravely contrary to chastity. I'd like to have you turn to the third page of this document and look at the third full paragraph and read the sentence beginning with allowing children. I'm sorry, which? Third full paragraph, which begins with the absence of sexual complementarity. Do you see that? Okay. The second sentence, or the sentence that begins allowing children. Allowing children to be adopted by persons living in such unions would actually mean doing violence to these children in the sense that their condition of dependency would be used to place them in an environment that is not conducive to their full human development. Finally, I would ask you to look at the last paragraph on the page, and about the middle of the paragraph there's a sentence that starts legal recognition of homosexual unions. Would you read that sentence into the record? Third sentence of the last paragraph, legal recognition. I'm sorry, we're still on the same page? We're on the third page of the document, or the last page of the document. What is the first word in that paragraph? The church teaches. That's over. Third sentence in that. Legal recognition. Right. Legal recognition of homosexual unions or placing them on the same level as marriage would mean not only the approval of deviant behavior with the consequences of making it a model in present-day society, but would also obscure basic values which belong to the common inheritance of humanity. Are those statements more moderate framing of religious views on homosexuality, in your view? Well, compared to some statements, they're more moderate, but I think they express the fundamental view, obviously, of the inferiority of homosexuals and the dangers that they pose to children. I'd ask you to look now at Plaintiff's Exhibit 168, which I'm going to move into evidence. May I approach, Your Honor? Very well. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Dr. Chauncey, this is a document, a resolution from the Southern Baptist Convention website on the topic of same-sex marriage. And I would ask you to look at the second page of the document. About the fourth paragraph up from the bottom, would you read that into the record? Whereas legalizing that one? Yes. Whereas legalizing same-sex marriage, quote-unquote, would convey a societal approval of a homosexual lifestyle, which the Bible calls sinful and dangerous, both to the individuals involved and to society at large, quotes Romans and Corinthians and Leviticus. Now, therefore, be it. And there's a number of resolutions, and I'd ask you to look at the next page and read the second paragraph. Resolved that we oppose all efforts by media and entertainment outlets and public schools to mainstream homosexual unions in the eyes of our children. And would you also read the last paragraph? Resolved that we call on Southern Baptists not only to stand against same-sex unions, but to demonstrate our love for those practicing homosexuality by sharing with them the forgiving and transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I have one more of these exhibits. I'd like you to look at Plaintiff's Exhibit 170. May I approach? We have no objection, Your Honor. Well, 170 will be admitted. This also is a resolution that is on the Southern Baptist Convention website, reflecting 
uh, its policies. Would you look at um, let's see one, two, three, four. The sixth paragraph down that begin on the first page that begins, whereas any action giving homosexual unions, do you see that? Yes. And read that into the record? Whereas any action giving homosexual unions the legal status of marriage denies the fundamental immorality of homosexual behavior, citing Leviticus 18.22, Romans, 1 Romans 26.27, 1 Corinthians 6, 9.11. And if you look four paragraphs down from that, resolve that we encourage, would you read that into the record? And the one following. Resolve that we encourage all Christian pastors in California and in every other state to speak strongly, prophetically, and redemptively concerning the sinful nature of homosexuality and the urgent need to protect biblical marriage in accordance with God's word, and be it further resolved that we call on all Southern Baptists and believers from all denominations everywhere to pray for the people of California as they seek to right this terrible wrong that has been forced upon them by the California Supreme Court's overturning of the vote of the people and to pray for the people of every state where biblical marriage is under attack. Dr. Chauncey, are these um, pronouncements by the Catholic Church and the Baptist uh, Convention consistent with your understanding of the religious beliefs, or at least some of them that were voiced in support of Proposition 8? Yes. Um, Professor Chauncey, I believe uh, Mr. Thompson asked you a number of questions about uh, people who may believe that homosexuality is sinful or have other religious beliefs that led them to support Proposition 8. Uh, do you recall that? Yes. Yes. I'd like you to assume for a moment that these religious beliefs are sincerely held. Um, would you nevertheless say that they could be affected by stereotypes of gay people that emerged from the 20th century or even earlier and still endure? Uh, yes. Um, you also described um, segregation theology yesterday, and I think you talked about it again today. And uh, during the battles over segregation and interracial marriage, did people hold sincere religious beliefs that were rooted in prejudice? Yes, that was certainly was the point of that testimony yesterday, that people do often hold deeply, sincerely religious convictions, which seem to them timeless, but historians shown have seen how they in fact change over time and naturally are shaped by uh, the larger culture in which they live uh, and so again people many people in the south um, deeply believed that interracial marriage was against God's will uh, I don't question their sincerity I believe though that that reflect the larger system of prejudices that had shaped um, their understanding of the world Thank you. Professor Chauncey, has there been significant progress toward reducing discrimination against gays and lesbians over the last several decades? Uh, there has been significant progress, yes. Is there still today significant discrimination against gays and lesbians? Yes, there is significant discrimination. Now, I have uh, my last line of questions this morning have to do with, or my last before I consult counsel anyway, my colleagues, um, with questions Mr. Thompson asked or one that he asked about whether the tone of political discourse has improved regarding gay rights issues. And I'd like to show you a video relating to this topic and ask you some questions about it. And uh, uh, we, Your Honor, we uh, had submitted uh, to the court and opposing counsel a list of uh, excerpts from the depositions that we intended to use in this trial, and these are the deposition excerpts for the defendant intervener, or uh, at least up heretofore the defendant intervener and proponent, uh, official proponent, Huck Shing William Tam. And I'd like to ask that those um, uh, excerpts be, be shown, stopping where there's been a document that we can then uh, ask the witness about. Your Honor, we, we would object to uh, Professor Chauncey being asked about this on multiple grounds. Uh, one of them is that it's not something he considered in his expert report. Uh, it's not a material considered. We weren't given an opportunity to cross-examine, uh, to depose him on this, and it's plainly outside the scope of Rule 26. 
Your Honor, may I respond to that? Of course. <laughs> he opened the door to it. He asked the question on cross about whether the um, dialogue about this issue has changed to be less hostile and uh, whether uh, people are much more polite and less uh, hateful in their commentary. And the witness testified about that. And this goes directly to that topic. Well, I think he, <clears throat> I think Mr. Uh, Thompson did open the door to that subject. Uh, the question is whether uh, this particular document is one appropriate to use with this witness. It's this, I gather, is the document that the Court of Appeals attached to its amended opinion in the... Um, I, I believe one of... One of the documents is, Your Honor, it's, it's a series of documents by one of the official proponents of Proposition 8 that were um, sent out to uh, people he tried to persuade to support Proposition 8, and including that document, to answer Your Honor's question. Uh, I would only add, Your Honor, that this gentleman had nothing to do with the campaign, even though he was an official proponent. The evidence will show quite clearly that he had nothing to do with the campaign. So this is, I didn't open the door to what indi specific individuals may or may not have thought. We have no problem with him testifying to this subject generally, just to these documents, which he's never seen before, to my knowledge. Your Honor. Um, as uh, Mr. Thompson suggested earlier in a question to the witness, there was broad messaging in this campaign from a lot of sources. And uh, um, uh, I can't remember if it's Dr. Tam, I think it is, um, did a great deal of messaging via the web on various websites about Prop 8. He was an official proponent. And uh, so I, I disagree completely with the idea that he had nothing to do with the campaign. He had a tremendous amount to do with the campaign. Are you, rep <coughs> excuse me, are you representing that these um, exhibits that you're referring to uh, were produced by <coughs> the intervener defendants. I am not, Your Honor. They were not produced. <coughs> I'm and sorry. They were not produced, and in fact, we had to find them. Uh, oh, no, no, no. Were put out as part of the campaign. Um, I, I think they were put out by Dr. Tam as part of the campaign. I see. And the connection is that he was one of the official proponents. Of Absolutely, Your Honor. And, and he was speaking about the campaign to a broad constituency <coughs> of Chinese voters. Your, Your Honor, the official campaign committee was protectmarriage.com, and these materials were not in any way associated with or paid for by, or uh, did anyone at protectmarriage.com have any cognizance of these documents? And, well, some, and depending on what they're going to show, many of them predated by years, Prop 8. Well, um, but and I, Pam was a an official proponent of Proposition 8, was he not? He, he was, Your Honor. I think one of the problems with allowing this line of questioning is we don't even know the date of these documents. Uh, and depending on what they're showing, uh, some of them are based on translations uh, from Chinese. I think they, they have said that they're going to call Dr. Tam on Friday. I believe the court will be able to hear from him and will have a complete record and it will be put in context. I, again, we have no objection to the line of questions, just the use of the documents. Your Honor, the, the deposition, Ms. Dr. Tam t testified about the documents, authenticated the documents. And I just want to point out, not, not only is he an official proponent and will the deposition uh, indicate what the documents are and the context in which they were used, um, but if we can look at messaging or be beliefs articulated by Kerry Pregene, I, I would think certainly the witness could be asked to comment on messages put out by one of the official proponents of the campaign. Well, let's see where the uh, questioning goes with these documents. I may cut you off at some point if it goes too far afield. Um, let's, let's see how, uh, how the testimony goes. Thank you, Your Honor. If you would show the first excerpt. Am I correct that you are one of the official proponents of Proposition 8? Yes. Okay. And how did you come to be an official proponent of Proposition 8? I was invited by protectmarriage.com. 
I am going to show you a document. I'll ask the court reporter to mark this as TAM Exhibit 1. And can you tell me what this is? Uh, this is, uh, let's see. Well, just as I said here, declaration of Hacking William Tim in support of proposed intervener's motion to intervene. And on the last page of this document, uh, is that your signature? Yes, it is. Okay. And um, you read this document before you signed it? Yes. Okay. And um, it's true and correct and accurate as, as far as you know? Yes. Paragraph 27 says, as an official proponent, I invested substantial time, effort, reputation, and personal resources in campaigning for Proposition 8. For example, I dedicated the majority of my working hours between January 2008 and November 2008 toward qualifying Proposition 8 for the ballot and campaigning for its enactment. I organized several rallies in support of Proposition 8, parentheses, which were attended by thousands of voters, close parentheses, coordinated volunteers from the Asian American community, and raised thousands of dollars for the Proposition 8 campaign. You see that where I've read, read that into the record? Yes. Okay. And um, is that true and accurate to the best of your understanding? Yeah. Okay. Are there any other people um, who you're aware of who are associated with protectmarriage.com uh, during the time period that we're talking about, January to November 2008, who you communicated with in connection with the Proposition 8 activities? Uh, I communicated with uh, Ron Prentice, also uh, Andrew Punil, and uh, Schubert, Schubert Flynn. Well, let me ask you another question about paragraph 27, Dr. Ting. Um, the last sentence of that paragraph says, I organized several rallies in support of Proposition 8, which were attended by thousands of voters, coordinated volunteers from the Asian American community, and raised thousands of dollars from the, for the Proposition 8 campaign. Uh, the first part of that sentence, I organized several rallies in support of Proposition 8, which were attended by thousands of voters. Were those public rallies? Yes. Okay. And and they were advertised by what flyers or how did you how did you attract people to those rallies? Uh, we noticed the churches, uh, not open invitation. So you sent notice. You, you, you basically handed out notices of the rallies at the different churches and said we're going to yes. have a rally at such and such a time in such and such a place. Yes. W what were the venues for those? Were they public venues? Uh, yeah. Can you tell me where what, what what the venues were? One is in Chinatown. The there's a square there in Chinatown. Okay. So uh, another one is uh, Cupertino's Memorial Park. Okay. Uh, and then there is one down in um, that one. I helped, but not. Uh, I haven't gone there because uh, of my time. Uh, that is in front of the LA City Hall. Okay. And were those the three different rallies that you can think of now that you were involved in? Yes. Um, who participated in those rallies? Who were the, I guess, the speakers at those rallies that you've just identified? Oh, um, let's see. Some pastors. Okay. Can you think of any of their names? Uh, can I? You can answer. Yeah, this is public. Okay. Uh, the Chinatown one, we had uh, Reverend Hanson Lowe, Reverend Paul Chow, um, Reverend Peter Ng, um, The rest I don't quite remember. Oh, Reverend Roof, Roof, Go. Um, yeah. Okay. And then the one on the Cupertino in Cupertino, uh, we had Ron Prentice, we had um, Tony Perkins, 
Reverend Thomas Wang and a Korean pastor, I forgot his name. Uh, that's about it. Did you also speak at those at those rallies? No. How about the one in LA that you mentioned? The one in LA, uh, Ron Prentice spoke, uh, and then I think David Kai, Reverend David Kai. I don't know about the rest because I was not able to go down there. So, but I know these two persons spoke. Okay. And when you say that these rallies were attended by thousands of voters, was that thousands of voters at each rally or thousands of voters in the aggregate for those three? Uh, aggregate. Okay. And aggregate. when you say thousands, can you be more specific? Uh, let's see. should be a total of, uh, let's see, maybe 6,000 people. Now, did you also... Um, engage in, in sort of writing for the Prop 8 campaign? In other words, did you yourself write articles, newsletters, anything like that that you sent out to people, to potential voters, in support of the Prop 8 campaign? Uh, yes. Okay. And can you put a ballpark number on how much, you know, how many such writings you authored during the Prop 8 campaign? I think about five. And can you tell me what, where those were published and what sort of medium did you use to publish those articles or newsletters or whatever they were? Again, um, Dr. Tam, I'm going to direct you to not answer to the extent that any of this writing that you are potentially referring to was to private groups or, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, not to the voters in general, but to the extent that you had any writings that were, for example, sent to the media or published in the papers. You certainly feel free to answer. Mm -hmm. I have one paper sent to the Chinese newspaper. The Chinese newspaper. Which which newspaper? Uh, Ming Pao. Is that a local San Francisco Chinese language right. paper? Right. Right. M I N G P A O. Can you think of any other? Uh, the others are private. Are they church type groups or? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. As a court to mark is TAM Exhibit 3, this document. Dr. Tam, if you take a moment to read that, that document. Um, and while Dr. Tam's reading it, I'll just describe it for the record. It's a printout of a, um, of a web page. Um, the uh, address is, is at the bottom there. Uh, and at the top it says, what if we lose? And it says it's presence ministry is the, is the um, icon at the top. Uh, if I could no, now... Okay. So what's your question? I could now ask the witness to look at plaintiff's exhibit 513. which is the document um, uh, Dr. Tam had just been asked about. And if you would, um, would you just read the first paragraph of this? Why don't you just go right to the question? Okay. Well, Ask him to read it <clears throat> to himself and then go right to the question. Okay. So <clears throat> let me play the video a little bit longer. Uh, have you seen this document before, Dr. Tam? Yes. Okay. And, and did you write this letter that's here on this page? Yes, I did. Okay. Do you remember about when you wrote this? Should be sometime before the last election. Okay. But you remember writing it at some point during the property yes, campaign? Yes, I did. Okay. Now, looking at this, the, the beginning of this uh, document, Dr. Chauncey, can you tell me if you think um, this messaging by Dr. Tam, this letter that he wrote, uh, reflects sort of a lower hostility level than past uh, <coughs> communications about gay people or homosexuality? Uh, no, this is um, uh, consistent in its tone with a much longer history of 
anti-gay uh, rhetoric. Uh, it describes um, uh, the right to marry as um, the legalization of prostitution. Um, it says that it's put forth by the San Francisco city government, which is under the rule of homosexuals. Uh, it talks about them pushing the gay agenda and says that after legalizing same-sex marriage, they want to legalize prostitution and that the next item on their agenda is legalizing having sex with children. So this um, reproduces many of the major themes of the anti-gay rights campaigns of previous decades and um, a longer history of anti-gay demonization. I'd like to offer this document into evidence, Your Honor. Or Mr. Thompson. <clears throat> we, we have no uh, objection to the court taking judicial notice of it, Your Honor. Uh, may I read two sentences from his deposition to give context? To, since we've seen a long portion of it? You may. Uh, with respect to the document, it does appear that during deposition, the uh, witness, who, the deposition witness who was a party to the lawsuit, uh, indicated that he had written the document, and therefore it would appear to be appropriate to be admitted. Y yes, Your Honor, and as I say, we have no objection to that. I, I did want to make clear that uh, Mr. Right. Tam <clears throat> said in his deposition at page 19, lines 19 to 22, <clears throat> he was asked how many times during 2008 from January to November he had had com conversation with Mr. Schubert. He said one or two times, very rare. The impression that's being created that this was part of the campaign is not true. We have no problem with discussions about an individual, a private citizen, who uh, is now attempting to withdraw to avoid precisely this sort of focus on his uh, individual views. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. You may proceed, uh, Ms. Stewart. Um, we go on to the next excerpt. <clears throat> um, and let me just read the, the first paragraph into the record here. It, um, it, it says, Dear Friends, um, this November, San Francisco voters will vote on a ballot to, quote, legalize prostitution, end quote. This is put forth by the SF city government, which is under the rule of homosexuals. They lose no time in pushing the gay agenda, dash. After legalizing same-sex marriage, they want to legalize prostitution. Uh, what will be next? On their agenda list is, colon, uh, legalizing having sex with children. And that's, that's the first paragraph. Did you write that paragraph? I believe so, yeah. But let me ask you more generally, does the phrase the gay agenda or gay agenda mean something to you? Yes. And what does it mean to you? If you Google this, this two terms, you'll find out. It's in the internet. I'm sorry, what, what is in the internet? The, the meaning the of that phrase? The gay agenda. Okay. Well, what you, can you tell me? What your understanding of that phrase is? Oh, uh, can I answer that? Yes. Okay. Well, this there are several uh, different websites describing the gay agenda. Um, what I read is that they had uh, there was a meeting back in 1972, I believe, in Chicago composed of gay leaders, they set out their, the, the platforms of their movement. So that's where I read it. Okay, and, and is it your understanding that part of the gay agenda is legalizing underage sex? Right. So you understand that to be part of the gay agenda? That's what I read from that. Okay, and do you believe that to be true? I'm going to instruct oh, you not I'm to not answer, that. answer that. Um, what is the basis for your not answering that question? Uh, again, the basis is First Amendment. I think you're asking him about his personal, uh, private beliefs. And again, I think both based on the First Amendment and Judge Walker's orders, it's not relevant. And what is your role with the Traditional Family Coalition? Uh, I'm the executive director. 
did the traditional family coalition urge people to vote for Proposition 8? Uh, we have some memberships in the, in the organization. So I encourage them to vote yes on Prop 8. Uh, Dr. Tam, if you please read that document, and while you're reading it, I'm, I'm going to just identify it for the record. Uh, this is another printout from another web page. Um, the title at the top says, A Message from Bill Tam, Perens, uh, Sharon, S-H-A-R-O-N, Chinese Baptist Church of San Francisco, close quote. Um, there's a, uh, a, a web address at the bottom. Let me know when you finish looking at that document, Dr. Tam. Okay, I'm done. Um, did, did you write this this letter that's here on this web, on this document, Exhibit Four? Yes. Okay. Um, and are you familiar with Sharon Chinese Baptist Church? Uh, yes. Okay. Is that a church here in San Francisco? Yes. Um, I'd like to direct the witness's attention to Exhibit Five Sixteen. Um, I'd like to ask you to look at the second paragraph of this document. Are you moving 516 in? Yes, Your Honor. Deposition testimony of Mr. Tam. <laughs> Very well. <clears throat> you see that that paragraph is talking about uh, legislation um, passed by a local school board in, in Alameda County uh, on uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual education. Yes. You see uh, that it says that education such as this used to brainwash children so that one day they'll vote for same-sex marriage. Yes. Um, can you comment at all on that messaging in terms of whether it reflects a kind of less hostile messaging towards gay people? Well, I think that talking about brainwashing children um, is not a moderate phrasing. Um, it, it's certainly... Uh, uh, reflects a sort of continuing concern about homosexuals putting themselves forward um, you know, up and having an agenda. This appears to have been posted after the election. And, and Your Honor, that's, that's one of the problems we, we have with this whole line of questions with this witness is that there's not a, a, a tight temporal connection. You're going to see some of the documents in this binder are from 2005. Uh, others are translations for Chinese that haven't been certified. So uh, we, we continue to object to this entire line of inquiry. Your Honor, I think, uh, to my knowledge, and I apologize, I wasn't aware that one was in here, but most of these documents um, we can represent to the court were on the Dr. Tam's website um, at the time of the uh, Prop 8 battle. And also, um, in any event, um, this the, the, the document we just saw goes to the history of discrimination and the kind of messaging that is still out there more broadly, um, even since Proposition 8. Well, let's focus on um, what was the mes messaging uh, at or before the election at the time of the election or before, if you represent that the <clears throat> Exhibit 516 was in fact posted in this form or substantially the same form prior to the election, well, I think that's a sufficient connection. But let's uh, let's move along, Ms. Uh, Stewart. Yes, Your Honor. Um, can you proceed? Yes. Mainly uh, after the election, because it, it starts by talking about a six to one win on Prop 8. Yeah, I, I, so I did. I think I, I indicated, Your Honor, that th this one is post election. I, there's no question about that. Um, All right, well, let's, let's move along. Um, I'm sure that we'll get into these documents when uh, Mr. Tam testifies. Technical glitch, Your Honor. That? Technical um, delay.
Um, did you, during the Proposition 8 campaign, did you um, in, uh, take part in any, um, do you remember taking part in any uh, public debates regarding Proposition 8? Yes. Okay. And can you think of about how many times that happened? How many such debates you took part in? Uh, I can quote three right away. Okay. Um, and tell me about those three. Uh, one time, uh, maybe even four. Uh, one time, two times on the radio. Um, one time uh, with uh, New Media America or something um, that was televised. Um, yeah, maybe that, that's about it. So three, th three times. So three times. Twice on the radio you said and once that was televised? Yes. And how did that come to be? How, how did you? How did it come to be that you were part of that uh, debate? Uh, I was told by uh, Protect Marriage to take part in that debate. And who, who told you to do that? I forgot. Okay. I just got a phone call from them. Okay. Let me show you this then. This is TM Exhibit Seven. Uh, while Dr. Tam is looking at that document, it's a um, it's a four-page document. Again, a um, I guess it is a four-page document. Um, it's a printout from a website. The top says Prop 8 debate draws ethnic media fans tensions dash N A M, and it's uh, from the New America Media website. Is that the, um, the debate that you've been discussing, Dr. Tan? Yes. Okay. The paragraph there right underneath the picture on the first page, it says, pro-prop eight panelists argued that, quote, common sense, close quote, dictated that the historic nature of marriage as an institution between a man and a woman could not be expanded to include same-sex couples. Um, they also insisted that children would be harmed because they would be subjected to education on homosexuality in public schools if Prop 8 failed to pass. Do you see that paragraph there? Yes. And, and do you remember yourself advancing um, those arguments at that particular uh, debate? I have said something about children were affected if same-sex marriage become legal. Okay. But I don't recall using the word harm or something. So, okay. <clears throat> What do you remember saying on that topic of, of children and, and Prop 8? I, Are you asking what does he remember saying at this debate? Well, I was just following up on what, what he just said. Um, he said, I remember saying something about children, and I, I just want to know what you remembered what you were referring to right then. Oh, yeah, I was saying that uh, if same-sex marriage is legalized, then every child can grow up thinking whether he would marry John or Jane when they grow up. And that would cause a lot of problems for the parents. I also mentioned about uh, first grade children being brought to same-sex marriage uh, weddings of their, pa of their teacher, the, the two lesbians who get married. Uh, I thought that was inappropriate. So I was explaining that uh, children would be uh, affected involuntarily if same-sex marriage is legal. If I could ask a question. Dr. Chauncey, if you would, um, I'm particularly interested in the uh, commentary by Dr. Tam about uh, children growing up to think they could marry John or Jane and um, what you thought about that messaging in terms of what it was reflecting. 
Well, again, it's consistent with the um, ads, the major ads put out by the Prop 8 campaign um, in which the little girl or boy comes forward and s says that they've read a book in school um, about a princeman marrying a prince. So that makes them think that they could too. So there's a deep fear uh, about the simple idea that simple exposure to homosexuality or to same-sex marriage will lead children to become gay. And I think the phrasing here actually makes it clear that the issue is not just marriage equality itself, but it's antipathy to homosexuality. It's about they, they could be subjected to an education on homosexuality in public schools. Uh, it's not just being introduced to the idea of gay marriage, but being introduced to the idea that there are gay people in the world, uh, which is taken to be uh, they, uh, they opposed. It's, they clearly see this as a, um, an inferior, uh, despicable way of life. Thank you. Court reporter, mark this, please, as TAM Exhibit 8. Do you remember talking with Mr. McLaughlin of the Mercury? Uh, yes, yes. If you look at the second page of this document, um, maybe about, not quite halfway down the page, it's got your name there, Bill Tam of San Francisco, a Chinese-American who is leading the outreach effort in the Asian-American community to pass Proposition 8, conceded that proponents take, face a tough battle convincing many Asian-Americans to vote for measure. Um, next paragraph says, gay marriage supporters, quote, have very cleverly portrayed homosexuals as a kind of minority, end quote, Tam said. Uh, restart the quote. They've been very effective in portraying it as a civil rights issue, and this is very much a concern for us, close quote. Do you see that? Yes. Do, do you remember saying that to Mr. McLaughlin? Yes. Okay. Um, and why was it, a, well, first, who is the us in that, uh, in that sentence, in your quotation there? Oh, Asian Americans. It's a concern for Asian Americans that um, they've been very effective in portraying it as a civil rights issue. Mm -hmm. You have to. I'm sorry. The people that I know. Yeah. Okay. And why is that a concern? Because we think that civil right is about skin color, like me being an Asian that I cannot change it. Uh, that's how I understand the definition of civil right. Uh, but my concern is that if homosexuals portray themselves as another minority, then sexual preference can become a minority. That to me is, is, uh, is a concern. Um, if you look a few paragraphs down there, um, I guess right at the end of this article, right right above the line that says contact, contact Ken McLaughlin, mm -hmm. um, it says, quote, we hope to convince Asian Americans that gay marriage will encourage more children to experiment with the gay lifestyle and that the lifestyle comes with all kinds of disease, end quote, uh, Tam said. Do you recall telling Mr. McLaughlin that? Yes. Um, and... Is that, in fact, a concern that you have, what's, what's uh, stated there? Yes. Um, and why are you concerned? What, what, well, let me ask you to explain. What, what does it mean to you that uh, gay marriage will encourage more children to experiment with the gay lifestyle? What does that mean? That means uh, now there's an option for children to pick their marriage or take their, to pick their sexual preference because that actually happened to me when my daughter told me that her classmates uh, chose to become lesbians uh, and experiment with it after they noticed that same-sex marriage is a they think is a cool thing. Uh, they had some problem with dating with boys or getting dates from boys. So same-sex marriage, once this is in the air, they think that, oh, then why not, you know, try girls. So, so children did experiment with it. 
That's what I meant. Um, and then the second part of that quotation, it says, in that the lifestyle, um, meaning the gay lifestyle, comes with all kinds of disease. Um, what did you mean when you said that to Mr. McLaughlin? I mean sexually transmitted diseases. And it's all in the Internet. So is your understanding that the gay lifestyle as opposed to the straight lifestyle uh, comes with more diseases? The gay lifestyle has more diseases than the straight lifestyle? Uh, it's very easy to find reports in the Internet that uh, homosexuals do have a uh, higher proportion of the population getting AIDS and uh, syphilis. It, it's, it's all in the public record. Then straight. Dr. Tamal, you Your Honor, I'd like to move Exhibit uh, 515 into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. Is that 516 or 515? This one's 515, Your Honor. Very well. And I'd also, just while before we, I turn to the witness, um, like to move in the last exhibit, 514, which I think I forgot to do. <coughs> no objection, Your Honor. All right, 514 is in, and 515. Dr. Chauncey, um, I'm interested in you. Um, speaking about the messaging and how it relates to prior messaging and sort of the relative level of antipathy towards gay people that this kind of messaging expresses? Well, I think it's pretty consistent with um, the messaging in earlier campaigns. I mean, certainly, again, the persistent theme that homosexuality is a choice, um, that children who are exposed to homosexuals uh, to gay marriage, uh, but really to homosexuals in any form are likely to become homosexuals. So uh, a deep fear about the instability of um, children's sexuality. Uh, the association of homosexuality with disease, um, the claim that AIDS, uh, associating AIDS uh, exclusively with homosexuality, um, uh, thinking about the widespread heterosexual transmission of AIDS in Africa and in the United States. And I think you sort of have a, a pretty clear sense here of one of the themes that ran through all of the referendum campaigns beginning in 1977 um, with Anita Bryant's campaign that to um, pass an anti-discrimination measure or a measure that in some way granted equality to and recognition of gay people would legitimize them and that we should oppose this, uh, this rhetoric is claimed, just because we don't in any sense want to legitimize um, homosexuality and gay life uh, as a, a legitimate equal part of our society and that, and that marriage is one of the most powerful symbols of that for them. So it's premised on a notion of inequality and here a very strong um, um, hostility towards homosexuality. You're looking at that. Uh, I'll just describe it briefly for the record. Uh, exhibit 9, um, at the top it says newsletter. Um, the banner at the top says traditional family coalition, and then it says newsletter. Um, it's a two-page document. Yes. Do you recognize this? Yes. Uh, and while you're looking at that document, Dr. Tam, um, this again at the top says uh, TFC News, um, Volume 1, Issue 2, March, April 2006. Do you recognize this document, Dr. Tam? Yes. And what is this? Uh, TFC Newsletter. And as we discussed with Exhibit 10, um, would it be fair to say that you had uh, editorial um, control over this document? Yes. Um, the first article here, it's entitled Traditional Family Coalition in Action. 
and it begins on March 3rd. Traditional Family Coalition held a press conference on Christian's view on the movie Brokeback Mountain. Other than Dr. Bill Tam of TFC, Dr. Melvin Wong spoke from a psychologist's viewpoint. Um, and it lists some, some other people who spoke there. It says they spoke of the role broke sorry, they spoke of the role of Brokeback Back Mountain plays on misleading the public to believe that homosexual affairs are more noble and trouble free than traditional families. Do you see that? Yes. Um, uh, do you remember participating in such a press conference? I did. I did participate. Okay, and did you invite members of the media to attend that press conference, or you or, or TFC? Yes. Okay, and do you remember whether members of the media did attend that? Yes, some, some did. Okay. Okay. Um, the next paragraph begins, On March 20th, Dr. Tam gave a seminar for San Francisco church leaders on the homosexual movement and how it would affect the family and the church. He gave examples of some Scandinavian countries where homosexuals team up with liberal politicians. They lowered the legal age of sexual consent, legalized same-sex marriage, legalized prostitution, indirectly causing the disrespect of marriage and tremendous increase of the illegitimate birth rate. Uh, Similar seminars were also given at some local churches. Do you see that there? Yes. And do you remember giving such a seminar? Yes. Or actually, I guess such seminars, it refers to more than one. Do you remember about how many seminars were given? Mm-hmm. I don't remember the number. Six. I mean, can you give a ballpark? Uh, oh, let's see. Four. Something like that. Okay. Um, and does, does that paragraph that I just read into the record, does that accurately reflect the topics of those seminars? Yes. Okay. Do you remember approximately the number of people who attended those seminars All right, in total? It's hard to remember. Are we talking dozens, hundreds? Um, total. You mean? Correct. Yeah, I think you said three seminars that you remember. Right. That would be maybe a couple hundred. Your Honor, and I think we, we would object to uh, that document. It says March, April 2006 on it, plainly uh, before uh, Proposition 8 was uh, had even been qualified for the ballot. Uh, in addition, of course. What document are we talking about? Um, it's Exhibit 543, Your Honor. 43. Yes, it says, Your Honor, right under TFC News, March, April 2006. So we object on that relevance ground and on the relevance ground that these are the views of one individual uh, and not protectmarriage.com. Your Honor, this document, um, first of all, it's uh, earlier in the testimony, uh, Dr. Tam indicated that the traditional family coalition of which he is the head uh, supported Proposition 8 and advocated for it. Um, and that's at the uh, uh, 50, page 50 to 52 of the um, deposition in the excerpts that we've already seen. And secondly, this was on their website uh, along with a lot of other materials at the time they were on that website advocating uh, in favor of Proposition 8. And so um, we think it is relevant. And it also goes to the overall messaging um, that led up to the campaign. I'm going to sustain the objection based on what we've heard to date. We may revisit this when Dr. Tam testifies. <coughs> if the facts are as you represented them <coughs> with respect to the posting of this document, but for the moment I think Mr. Thompson is appropriately objected and the objection will be sustained. <coughs> All right, let's see if you can wrap up with this witness. <coughs> You mentioned the Chinese Christian Herald earlier this morning. Um, it's a Chinese language newspaper in the Bay Area. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And do you know uh, what its circulation is? 
about thirty to forty thousand a month. Okay. It's a monthly paper. Does it have a, an internet presence as well, or is it just a paper? Yes, newspaper? it has internet. Yeah. It has an internet yeah. as well. Um, and do you know whether your columns have been published both in the paper format and online? Yes. They have been? Yeah. And um, you recently co-authored a book called America Return to God with Reverend Thomas Wang. And that's correct? Yes. Okay. And it says you're often interviewed on radio, TV, newspaper, and news conferences in the San Francisco Bay Area. We've discussed some of those um, those appearances, I guess. Yes. Um, can you think, other than the uh, the interviews and debates that we've already discussed this morning, can you think of any other media appearances that you participated in with respect to the Proposition 8 uh, campaign or that involved the Proposition 8 campaign? There are a few uh, requests from Channel 26, Channel 7 to, to ask me about uh, Proposition 8 yeah, during the campaign. Okay, and did those result in interviews? Uh, some are during, some are after, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and and so you uh, you took part in those interviews, uh, resulting from those contacts. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And I, I'm sorry. How, about how many additional um, interviews are we talking about? Approximately. Five. Okay. And can you tell me what the subject matter was of those of those interviews? I mean, in, in any detail beyond just about Proposition Eight? Uh, mostly about uh, why uh, Prop Eight is necessary, um, and then about what's the current status of Prop 8, um, and then why 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 I was involved in it. Okay. And something like that. It, it's informational. It, it, and the on the, to know. I'm sorry. Um, and on the question of why Prop 8 is necessary, what, it, what do you remember the arguments that you advanced uh, in those interviews? Uh, yes, I uh, talk about children is the biggest benefit if Prop 8 passes, uh, that they would have uh, both parents as different sexes uh, to be their role models. If same-sex marriage passes and then uh, if it becomes popular, then those children who get adopted into same-sex families, they don't have two genders as their parents to model after. Uh, we, I talk about uh, oh, I don't really quite remember that much. It's, it's more than a year now. Um, while you're looking at that, Dr. Tan, uh, Exhibit 15 is a two-page document. Again, another printout from uh, a website. At the top, it says uh, Bill Tam, comma, PhD, and the heading is Articles on Parenting. Uh, underneath that, it says the following articles are written in Chinese. Most of them were published by Chinese Christian Herald. Um, and then please click on the link to view, and then it lists a uh, long list of articles. Um, so, Dr. Tam, you, you wrote all these articles that are that are posted here? Yes, I did. Okay, and can you identify which ones were, you say many of them were published in the Chinese Christian Herald, can you identify which ones were in fact published in the Chinese Christian Herald? Or maybe, since it says most, I mean, maybe it's easier to say which ones were not published in the Chinese Christian Herald, just to be efficient. Uh, on the parenting, I think all of them were published by, by the newspaper. Okay, so all of these articles listed here on this on this exhibit uh, Yeah, 15? as far as I can remember. And then 
You see the more articles uh, on the second page, more articles? Yes. Some of those, I think, was published in another Christian magazine or something. For the record, uh, Exhibit 18 is another, uh, it's actually two documents together. The first is uh, four pages of Chinese characters, and I'll, I'll represent again that this was uh, something that we went through from your website, Dr. Tam. And then the pages following that are a translation that we had done. Dr. Tam, looking only at the first four pages of this exhibit, do you recognize that as, as something you wrote? Yes, it is. Okay. And also that you posted to your website? Mm, I don't exactly remember. Maybe, yeah. If you find it. <laughs> um, maybe it helps to look back. If we look at Exhibit 15, which would be in your pile of exhibits there in front of you, do you see any uh, article listed on there that that you can tell corresponds with, with this uh, Exhibit 18? Your Honor, uh, I yeah. would ask that this be paused so that I can make uh, an objection. Very well. Uh, number one, these documents uh, have no dates on them, so we don't know whether they're relevant or not. And as we've seen from other portions in this binder, they're temporarily all over the place after the election, years before the election. In addition, many of these are in Chinese and have translations. And although it is true they were shown to Dr. Tam, we've seen from these snippets, his diction is festooned with errors. English is not his first language, and the fact that they show a translation to someone who doesn't speak very good English and said, is this correct, doesn't prove anything. It's not a certified copy of the translation. Well, I wouldn't characterize uh, uh, Dr. Tam's English in that manner. Uh, I'm persnickety, Your Honor. It does seem to me, Ms. Stewart, that uh, we've exhausted this topic. And would ask you to conclude your redirect examination. Okay, Your Honor, I will do that. Um, we'll return to this later um, with Mr. Tam or the deposition excerpts. I would think that would be the appropriate place to take it up. All right, please conclude. Uh, Dr. Chauncey, in what we've seen so far since uh, the last question I asked you is, are there any messaging that we you haven't already um, spoken about that uh, came through in some of what Dr. Tam has written that you'd like to comment on? Um, well, I think it reinforces for me the sense that um, although gay marriage was the topic at hand, um, the arguments being made were often against uh, gay rights of any sort. So there's a reference to the right of same-sex couples to adopt children, what effects that would have on children. Um, and so it, it it does seem to me to um, express the kind of hostility and kinds of arguments that have been made for several decades now um, in the context of these referenda battle and battles, and that again it draws on the the long history of hostility, stereotyping, and fears that I've described. Um, Dr. Chauncey, in some of the uh, documents, I noticed the phrase "gay agenda." Um, in your knowledge as an historian of the gay civil rights movement, is there a gay agenda? Um, uh, there has, uh, there, at various times, there have been a range of degrees of agreement or disagreement on various issues. Uh, my understanding is that that term, the gay agenda, was mobilized um, particularly effectively in uh, the late 80s and early 90s uh, in uh, combating uh, or in support of the referendum initiatives designed to overturn gay rights laws and it's uh, tried to construct the idea of a unitary agenda that includes um, uh, ending the age of consent laws um, and uh, again just sort of fills, uh, picks up on uh, these um, long-standing stereotypes. Um, Professor Chauncey, uh, earlier in, in, Dr. Uh, in Mr. Thompson's questions, he asked um, whether he asked you a question about conservative traditions 
teaching that everyone is a sinner. Do you recall that? Uh, yes. Um, are you aware of any movements in uh, our recent history, or for that matter, going back further, trying to um, deny adulterers the right to marry? Uh, I'm not aware of those. No. Um, in your testimony earlier today, when Mr. Thompson was talking to you uh, about your uh, book on gay marriage, um, he uh, asked you, or actually I take it back, I think he was referring to an exhibit that had to do with television characters and the increasing uh, television coverage of people, um, and your prior testimony about censorship. And I noticed that um, in a part of your book, um, your marriage book that he also read from, um, close to where he read, you use the term erased to describe what's happened to the historical record of discrimination against gay people. Um, can you describe what you meant by that and uh, tell us whether um, the uh, increasing number of gay characters on television has fully counteracted the effect of the erasure that you've spoken of? Which question do you want him to answer? Both, Your Honor. Well, then ask them one at a time. Uh, what you meant by the term erased? Uh, uh, what I meant by it was that um, for a very long time, uh, uh, very little research was done on the history of homosexuality or the place of gay people in American history. Uh, and it was actively discouraged, was not seen as a suitable topic. Um, uh, Certainly, even in my own career, um, which Mr. Thompson referred to, it's been a very fortunate career, um, but it's not a typical career. And uh, uh, I found uh, when I decided to write a dissertation in gay history um, that uh, many people advised me that it would be professional suicide to do so. Um, when I finally got a job at the University of Chicago, uh, in 1991, I became only the second person in the country to get an academic position, a tenure track position in the history department with a dissertation in lesbian or gay history. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, again, this, there has been some change on this front in recent years, and there are more students now um, writing dissertations in this field. Uh, they've continued to experience uh, trouble in getting jobs. More of them are beginning to get jobs, but I think that there's still many advisors around the country who would caution a student uh, who would consider um, publishing in the field. And I have to say I'm, I'm still struck as, as I try to put together the syllabus for a lecture course at Yale on lesbian and gay history, both by um, how limited the literature still is to draw on for that course, uh, and that, um, that one of the most consistent comments I receive on the course evaluations at the end of that course is that they'd never heard about any of this before in their high school or public school education or in college, that they were completely unaware of this history. And so it's pretty clear to me that the erasure of this history of the history of discrimination and of gay life itself uh, continues to be um, very pr prevalent in our culture. Thank you, Professor Chauncey. Nothing further. All right, Ms. Stewart, you brought us to afternoon after all. <laughs> all right, uh, let's uh, resume council at uh, 1.30, make it 1.40. And the next witness is going to be Dr. Peplow, Your Honor. Very well. One forty, Mr. Cooper. Is that okay? All right. Good.